Welcome to GS Podcast number 110. How the hell are you? Good? Good. On this episode, I'll be joined by comedian Jamie Kilstein. I wasn't really familiar with Jamie and his work, uh, but he got in touch via a mutual friend and I uh, thought his experience would make for a, a great discussion. Jamie was somebody who was a, a host of a really ultra progressive far leftist rad femme type podcast. He was described by many as a, as a male feminist and that was sort of the... Uh, filter of how we approach most topical and political discussions and what happened to Jamie is a few public allegations were made about his own conduct which we we go into in detail on this show and then the mob came for him too Um, the the whole internet shaming culture uh, and pylon mentality um, ate one of their own essentially so we'll be talking about his experience of that and, and coming through the other side and we'll be delving into comedy as well, how that's an important force in, in the world of politics and, and moving the discussion forward. And he'll be telling us about his own new podcast. So make sure you check that out. I believe he's got an interview with Moby lined up, which I'll be checking out. One of the reasons he was interested in coming on my show is that he'd heard that you, the audience, were a very open-minded, non-judgmental bunch uh, which, uh, you know, I'm annoyed that you're getting all the credit for my hard work, but whatever. <laughs> so if you've enjoyed hearing from Jamie, make sure you check him out on Twitter. Send him some love, send him some kind words, send him some follow-up questions. You can find him at Jamie Kilstein. That's K-I-L-S-T-E-I-N. You can keep up to date on the podcast at gspellchecker.com. Enjoy. There's a Very pleased to be joined by Jamie Kilstein. Jamie, welcome. Hi, buddy. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. How are you doing? Uh, I'm good, man. I'm excited about this. I've heard like really great things about the show and stuff. Well, that is a surprise, but I will take it. Ha, well, also take in mind that like uh, um, the uh, I think I've heard it in the sense that like, hey, you get in trouble and piss off a lot of people. You'll like my friend. And then <laughs> th- that's how we met. It-, it-, it wasn't strictly on content. I feel like I bond <laughs> with people more about like the fucking Internet wars that I've been in over like, you know, quality. <laughs> uh, but either which way I figured would be friends. Yeah, sure. I do specialize in trouble and pissing people off. So I think you are in good company. Um, oh, good. Maybe you could just start by explaining what you do to those who don't know how would you describe what you get up to nowadays yeah so um i just came out of hiding and (laughs) uh i'm going back to uh stand up i'm actually working on uh, a whole show for fringe for edinburgh which is kind of where i got discovered um and so i'm planning on going back there in the uk in july and august and i'm sort of writing right now about like um The extremes of like the PC left, but also the extremes still of the right. I haven't completely sold out my old progressive ways Um, and, you know, depression and suicide and funny stuff like that, buddy. (laughs) Funny stuff like uh, spending a year wanting to kill yourself because that's comedy. And so I'm doing that. And then I just started uh, I just started a new podcast, which I'm actually really excited about uh, called Fuck Up Pod. Or I think you have to look up F Up Pod with Jamie Kilstein, um, where I'm interviewing uh, musicians and comics. And we're talking about politics, but also like I interviewed Moby for next week and it's literally an hour of us talking about how we don't understand relationships and our insecurities and, and shit like that. So yeah, man, it's good. Uh, that is what I am doing now. 
Did you say you were you interviewed Moby? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and Moby just sadly complained about how we're bad at relationships for literally like an hour and a half. Excellent. I'll be uh, sure to keep an eye out for that one. Dude, so good. Yeah, yeah. So it's just uh, fuckuppod.com or just look it up in iTunes. And uh, yeah, I'm actually really proud of it, which is rare. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit more later on as well. But uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about your your transition, shall we say. You, you used to identify as a, as a male feminist. Now, I, I too, I thought we used to describe myself as a, a feminist many years ago. But now I, when I'm asked whether I'm a feminist, I tend to ask, what do you mean by feminist? because the the definitions and the lines seem to have been very blurred by this increase of internet culture, shall we say. So what what would you say your core values were when you identified as a male feminist, if you did self-identify that way? Yeah, man. Well, uh, much like you, I didn't think it was going to be a fucking thing. I was just like, yeah, women are good. Like, that's it, right? Like, you want you want uh, men and women to have equal opportunities. You don't want to be uh, a fucking creep, you know? If a, if a woman doesn't want to fuck you, then you go, good day, madam. Like, <laughs> uh, it, 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 it should be fairly simple. So, yeah, when kind of asked... Um, if I, I was a feminist, I, I said, sure. And, you know, I definitely made, um, you know, I did stand up on like, uh, you know, cat calling and fucking rape shit and, uh, things that I thought were, were pretty much common sense. The problem was, um, I'm very self-hating and self-conscious and I went from being, a very political comic who struggled, man. Like when, uh, you know, under the Bush administration, my entire act was talking about religion and uh, and politics. That's kind of how I got discovered. But I was bombing over here. I mean, I would sell out an Edinburgh show or I got to play the fucking Sydney Opera House with Christopher Hitchens. Oh, wow. But then I would... Yeah, dude, like it was nuts. But then I would come back to New York and I couldn't even get booked at a shitty, you know, chuckle comes or, or whatever. Like I couldn't get booked at like a comedy club. So I would go overseas and have all these reviews and feel really good about myself and then come back here and sort of fail. So at that time, politics and comedy isn't what it is now. Like, fuck, man, I don't want to have any Donald Trump jokes in my act just because it seems hacky at this mm. point. And because everyone's doing it. But back then, um, you know, t- I was sort of the hipster of that and the hipster uh, of me, too. Uh, but back then, it, it, it really, really could fuck you over. So what happened was my audience started getting way more political and less comedy um, savvy. And so you know, I said this on Rogan's show. I'm not trying to like do a bit. I just think it's the best example where when I knew my audience kind of went off the rails was I was like defending trans people a couple years ago on my old podcast, which is very, very left. And somebody wrote in the next, I, I called a transphobe an idiot. Uh, definitely not the edgiest thing I've ever said, um, but I called him an idiot. And somebody wrote in the next day, And was like, while we appreciate you defending the trans community, uh, the word idiot is ableist. Oh, what a fucking idiot. Yeah, dude. I wanted to be like, oh, you're a cunt. Like, I didn't know what to (laughs) fucking say. And but instead, I just was like, I'm sorry, because like the bottom line is like because I'm trying to figure it out now. I'm trying to figure out when people are like, did you sell out? I'm like, no, I really thought I was doing the right thing, but also You know, I dropped out of high school. I've always had a chip on my shoulder about being stupid. Um, I have like every learning disability known to man. Um, And suddenly I am the funny guy in the progressive circle instead of like the political comic, right? As I started becoming more political, that became my circle. You know, my ex-wife was a journalist for The Nation. Um, Our show started to get more political fans because I was touring less. Whereas when the show started, it was all my comedy fans from touring and mostly from like the UK and Australia. And so if somebody told me I was wrong or that was offensive, um, I kind of bought it 
And I would go, yep, it must be my fault because I was used to being the fuck up. And but the beginning of my career, man, I think I was on the first like atheist panel on MSNBC, which for your over. I mean, you guys know what it is over there, but like the, the very progressive station, I, uh, you know, my TV debut, like George Carlin's daughter gave it to me and I railed about religion and it was filthy. And every interview I did was quoting Hicks and, and, and Carlin and, and talking about how comedy is important because you can take these horrifying issues and make them funny. And once you can shine a light on them, you can start to investigate them. That's why I became a comic. People were like, uh, you know, were you the class clown? I was like, are you out of your fucking mind? The class clown beat the shit out of me. Um, like I wasn't the class clown. I was a fucking loser. And I had like, uh, my mom was a raging alcoholic and I was crying every fucking day. And you know, when, uh, when they're like, do you remember the first time you wanted to be a comedian? It wasn't like a nice story. It wasn't like, well, me and my family were sitting around the table and we were watching Johnny Carson. It was like, no, my mom got arrested and me and my brothers were upstairs and we didn't know what the fuck to do. And we started making really dark jokes instead of crying and those dark jokes broke the ice enough to make us feel human and make us laugh. And once that happened, you can start to actually problem solve. And, and that's sort of why I think I was drawn to going after the church and going after religion and bigots and stuff like that. Um, I just sort of lost myself in it because I had spent so long struggling and feeling dumb. And suddenly I was getting all these validation from really intelligent people. And I was making a, a really good living that when it started to go off the rails, even though I still identified my core values are still don't be a racist cunt. Don't be a sexist cunt. Don't be a homophobic cunt. Uh, those values were there. So when people were telling me I had to up those, I just assumed naturally like, yeah, you know, of course you're right. Cause I'm like the dummy who says cunt and you're the smart person who goes, you know, and writes for mother Jones magazine or whatever. Does that make sense? Was that all too much? <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. That makes sense. And I, I just, I mean, at, at what point then did you, I mean, when you was, um, posting on citizen radio, it was a very, ultra progressive left leaning i think i um, you may have even referred to it as possibly an attack machine in, in some sense in the case that you was actively looking for people who were sort of transgressing these leftist lines of purity and i, I just wondered how how do you get to that point from being somebody who seems quite open minded you mentioned there you took on religion and and uh, you know politics and, and various other things how did you get to that point where you're actually looking for people to make the the enemy yeah, well, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's definitely part of me um, that, you know, once, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but once that community kind of turned on me, there was definitely part of me that wanted to completely turn and be like, I fucking hope Trump makes abortion illegal and fucking goddamn <laughs> Mexicans and I'm going to go kill a pig and eat them with, you know, like I wanted to sort of sell out all my shit, uh, especially because, you know, I went from, um, having a really great life, like financially and artistically, and then uh, being suicidal and hiding and sort of losing everything and blah, 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 blah. But, um, you know, I, I will say that it happens a lot on the left, but I think it's more, I think it happens on the internet in general, in mm. social media, where you're in your bubbles Right. Whether it's the atheist bubble or I mean, dude, how many times have there been like uh, intra atheist fighting where like these atheists are against these atheists and it feels like your world because it's your Facebook, it's your Twitter and this person's mad at this person. And he was supposed to speak at a conference. But, you know, he said that whatever. Um, and you feel like it's the entire world. But if you went outside and you were like, hey, man, have you just to a random person, like, have you heard of this atheist conference? And be like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> uh, and it's the same with comedy and it's the same with feminism. And on the I mean, left, not, not just that, too. I mean, I think people, the way people interface, I think they always start off on a, a kind of a, a foot of hostility straight away on, on the Internet. I think just the the uh, the limitation of having to be quite succinct to do that to you for a start, because I, I used to. 
I used to get involved in battles and skirmishes on, online all the time. And you, you kind of assume that's going to carry over into the real, real world, like you just said. So when I'd go to conferences and speak at places or get recognized in public, I'd, I'd instantly expect somebody to be rather hostile or mean to me. And uh, the opposite of that's usually true in person, isn't it? People are friendly. Yeah. and pl- Even if they disagree with you, they, they tend to be courteous and, and civil. And, and nine times out of 10, whatever agreement it is you have, you can sort of leave that um confrontation shall we say in goodwill and actually feeling better about it and better about yourself but that that just doesn't seem to exist online at all why, why do you think that is well i think well two things one to respond to what you just said i i think you said it perfectly where you know i mean i've gotten thousands of death threats i've gone from thinking that you know Every Republican thinks I'm a, a, a commie anarchist who needs to be uh, assassinated um, uh, to the opposite of it, where everyone on the left thinks I'm a fucking rapist and I've walked around with hoodies and sunglasses and all this stuff. I've never once had somebody be confrontational in, in, in real life. One, because they're cowards, or two, because it's the internet and it doesn't seem like you're talking to a real person. It doesn't seem like you're sending a death threat to a real person. It's just a Twitter icon and you're trying to get your faves and your retweets. Right. Um, and then conversely, once I kind of came back out in the public and started doing my old friend shows and, you know, going on like, uh, atheist shows again and, and doing Rogan and Stan Hope show, I've had people come up to me who have introduced themselves as like, Hey man, we used to fight on Twitter and now we're like friends, you know? Mm. Uh, and these are people that I probably went fucking at it with. And at the time I wanted to like fight and it's like, no man, they're just normal people. So what I think happens is I think we are so social, you know, I mean, you've probably stopped doing that less as you've gotten more successful, right? Like, or, or for me, uh, I haven't necessarily gotten more successful, but I've become more just happy as a human. Yeah. And uh, it's more about and, time and, and, management nowadays. I kind of think, what what could I get done in the half an hour it would take to argue with some anonymous wanker on the internet? Oh my, dude! You know how many fucking books I've read? Like I've had, <laughs> like, I've read books. I've like I've gone outside. I had this moment the other day that I I was on my phone. And I go, I'm, I live in Los Angeles now. And I go, I'm just going to put my phone away and try to like be present, right? And like I put my phone away and I like literally looked up at the sky and I started thinking about what the sky was. And I looked and I saw there were fucking mountains and palm trees and all this stuff. And I felt like I was on mushrooms. I felt like I was tripping <laughs> and I was getting a high literally by just putting my goddamn fucking phone away and looking around and smiling at people. And yeah, man, I've become such a fucking hippie. So what I here's what I think happens. I think everyone's in their bubbles and they see what everyone in their bubble is fighting about, right? So I would see, okay, everybody's mad at this writer, David Frum. I don't have time to read his article because that would be informative and (laughs) stupid. I have to get my shit retweeted before everyone else has like put out all the good jokes. So I kind of like look at people's tweets and I gather from what they said, okay, David Frum uh, is criticizing Trump. Well, fuck this guy because he was the one who wrote the Axis of Evil speech under Trump. So I guess the the key to making a joke there is about hypocrisy. So I'm going to put together this joke, blah, 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 blah. It's supposedly because I care about the war and I don't want innocent blood being spilled. But in reality, I'm not sitting there trying to fucking end the war. I'm not trying to figure out a way to like – make sure my tax money doesn't go to support like blowing up fucking brown people. I'm not even signing a fucking petition. Fuck man. I'm not even voting. I'm refreshing my Twitter to see if my esoteric David from tweet about an article that I'm not going to fucking read because I'm like borderline illiterate and I have ADD and I'm just refreshing my Twitter. I want to see if a celebrity favorited it or I want to see if someone retweeted it. And now let's say Chrissy Teigen fucking favored it. Am I going to write her and be like, we have to do something about the war? No, I'm going to fucking DM her and I'm going to go, oh, I'm so glad you follow. I'm like a huge fan. Like maybe John Legend wants to listen to my music. You know, it's going to be some self-serving garbage. And I think that it just that is the world we live in. We get to go on Twitter and we get to fucking start fights with celebrities we don't know. We get to get validation from celebrities we don't know. Um, And if you came from uh, 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 if you have insecurities um, and you feel like a piece of shit in your day to day life, 
Oddly enough, you're not a, you're probably not a piece of shit. You probably just spend so much time on Twitter hating yourself and self-doubting that you don't give yourself the opportunity to meet people in the real world or to date or to go fucking hiking or to whatever. Um, you know, it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You go there for validation and then you have to keep one-upping yourself, right? So I think for me, it just came from self-hate. There's a lot of stuff that I did and a lot of people I attacked that I still agree with. Um, but it was just an, a really negative space to put out these thoughts um, and, and you got rewarded for it. You get rewarded for it. And I think that's sort of where it came from. And, you know, what I'm trying to do now, I mean, it's still hard. Like I'm back on social media now and it's hard not to, you know, be like, we got to burn down Washington. But, um, I am trying to just sort of be, you know, talk about myself more and, and, and be more sort of self-aware and just get the fucking podcast out and meet cool people and then get the fuck off and go do yoga or some shit. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, when you're in this ultra progressive circle, I, I mean, I tend to find these, these, areas of people or the I suppose they've been termed social justice warriors by some and I tend to find that they, they end up eating their own anyway because the, the the kind of revolving door of purity test that they set kind of ends up hitting them in the arse anyway at some point and, and this sort of happened to you in a way they came for you eventually and there were some allegations made uh, they've been referred to as disturbing disturbing allegations now I've read a, a couple of articles and it's been very difficult to try and discern what those allegations were uh i mean i'm not sure yeah. if that, I, 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 that maybe that reflects better on you and I, I thought maybe i'd just give you an opportunity to speak about what happened there yeah man um yeah so it's we really do we really do eat our own um and and i think this i again i think this comes down to social media where it's like People want to be out offended. I, I really do believe that the majority of people who are tweeting out, um, you know, about this comedian said this, they're not actually personally affected. They're not actually hurting. They weren't actually triggered. But it's just, you know, that's what everyone's mad about that day. And then it'll go away the next day, right? Like John Ronson wrote about that really well in uh, his So You've Been Publicly Shamed book. Oh, that's a great um, book. Dude, it's so good. Something I, I managed to read while I, whilst I wasn't arguing on the internet. Yeah, exactly. Me too. And like, I was, uh, I was actually really scared to read it just because I went through so much fucking, you know, trauma with all this shit. But I, I finally read it, and it was so cathartic and so good. And anyway, so, um, yeah. So what happens? So, I, I, I think what happens is you just try to be. The, the, the most hipster progress. You know, it's like when someone goes like. I like Radiohead and you're like, well, I like Radiohead's live stuff. And someone's like, well, I only like Radiohead's live stuff when they toured Europe in like 1993. And they're like, well, I only like uh, the cassette tape of Tom York jerking off into a potted plant. Uh, you know, and <laughs> it just keeps work. going. His best work. It's his best work. Pre Harvey Weinstein, Tom York was jerking off into potted plants and taping it on Maxell audio cassettes. And um, so, so that's what happens, right? It's like, um, I think Me Too is a great example. So Rose McGowan comes out and is like, Harvey Weinstein's a rapist. And everyone goes, yay. And then the next day, liberals are like, wait a second. We're all we're all being too – we're on the same page. This is stupid. So you go, well, why didn't Rose McGowan talk about the black women who were raped? And then hmm. now, we're, now we're split. And now it's a racial thing. And then the next day, someone goes, well, you know, what about the trans black people? And then they're like, all right. And then it's like, well, what about the trans black people who are in a wheelchair? And then someone's like, well, what about the trans black people who are in a wheelchair and uh, want to be like Tom York and jerk off into a potted plant? But they can't because, like, their left arm doesn't work. And you're just like, Jesus Christ. Like, we can't actually go out. After one issue, we have to just out progressive each other. Right. So, I mean, what happened to me, it, it's really hard. It's hard to go into what I'm desperately trying to do. And the more podcasts I do, I've definitely become like a little looser with my tongue. But I really am trying to fucking high road myself out of this man and not go after uh, people specifically. So I'm going to try to I'll go after journalism. We'll disguise it. Your, your fans seem very savvy. You'll be able to figure it out. Um, but what happened was I um, – just to be very clear, if everything in the articles are true – so I'm not talking about the articles that 
you know, I mean, journalism nowadays, man, is a, a headline will say a unproven accusation and then the article is a recap and a bunch of people tweeting. Hmm. And that and that's journalism. That's yeah. fucking our new Woodward and Bernstein is like babe dot com and random people on Twitter. And so, you know, most of the quote unquote, like the articles about me are just like recaps of that. It's just like what my ex-wife wrote uh, and my ex-wife, to be very clear, never wrote that I did anything to her. She was just also reporting on quote unquote accusations. Um, and it was random people on Twitter. The most in-depth article and the only one that interviews people is on Jezebel. Yes. Um, I'm so sure, I did I'm read sure that you, one actually, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you guys are all very surprised it was Jezebel. <laughs> and uh, if everything in that article, just so your your poor fucking fans don't think you're giving like a platform to like an accused rapist. That's next week, to be honest. Oh, good. Good, good, good. <laughs> I, hope I, I hope I can be brought back for panel. Um... <laughs> A panel of rapists with the godless spell checker. So uh, I uh, – if everything in that article is true, which it is not, let's say it is, um, I was accused of having uh, a long-term consensual relationship with, granted, uh, a woman who – worked with us, but the relationship continued a year afterwards, um, a year after she worked for the show. I was accused of, uh, flirting via direct message on Twitter, nothing sexual. Um, and when she said she had a boyfriend, I apologized. And then the last one, which I can go into a little more detail, cause I think this should show you the, how ridiculous, um, these are. The last one was I had a date um, I had a date that I set up with, um, with a woman, uh, we were talking on Facebook at this point, it makes it sound like I was cheating on my wife, but we were in a, an open relationship, which we talked about on the show publicly. We were actually in an open relationship for a long time before we talked about, uh, about it on the show, but we didn't talk about it. And it was just fucking weird, man. It was like a don't ask, don't tell open relationship. So like, I still felt like I was like, cheating and like I was like hiding text messages and I could only have sex when I was like on the road because I didn't want to like sleep out when I was home in New York and like it's also like uh not easy to get pussy when you're at a bar and a woman goes like are you in a relationship and you go I'm in a secret open relationship because that sounds like you're full of shit um so it was a nightmare so I begged my ex like we got to talk about this on the show so anyway so most of this happened when we were in an open relationship and so I think it also makes it sound like I had sex with this woman, which I didn't. Um, you know, we hooked up and we hooked up and, you know, oddly enough, I did what a good feminist should do, which is when we hooked up, she said, she's like, before we hooked up, she's like, just so you know, I don't want to have sex. And I go, cool. Um, even if you change your mind, uh, I will make this the bar and like, I'll shut it down. Right. Mm hmm. And so we didn't, we didn't have sex. And in the article, um, and a, a subsequently she wrote another email to a, a different like feminist podcast. So I might be conflating the two, but the, the premise of it was, remember this is an article that like says that I've been accused of sexual misconduct and uses the word abuse. I mean, these are things that make me sound like I have been accused of like actual abuse of being a predator of all the stuff. Um, she goes, I've never felt like safer with a man. It was the first time I've trusted <laughs> like a man in years. I mean, it sounds like blurbs I should use for my Tinder bio. Mm. This sounds fucking great. And then in the article goes, but a week later or however long later, he called me a road fuck on his podcast. And then Jezebel in parentheses says Jezebel could not find that article. And it's like, right. Yep. You couldn't or couldn't find that quote. It's like you couldn't find that quote, you bunch of fucking retards, because I wouldn't talk about road pussy on a feminist podcast that I host with my wife who's sitting right next to me. So the quote doesn't exist. But let's say it does exist. And let's say I went on my feminist podcast and I was like, today we're going to honor Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But first, let me tell you about some fucking road vag that I smashed. Um, <laughs> let's say that did happen, right? That's not abuse. That's me being an asshole and a comic. 
Yeah, so that's uh, that's just a a man being promiscuous, I suppose, in a way. I mean, if that if, you know, if that is the the um, the reality of it. But I mean, so at what was the at what point did this lead to you leaving Citizen Radio? Was it a case of you were fired? Did you leave? How did this impact that aspect of it? Oh yeah, that was another thing. Um, that was another thing. The and, and I, I I try not to talk about like. Uh, my ex-wife and stuff. So like, I'll leave, I'll leave the, the scandalous details out, but we were essentially starting to get wind of this. It was only happening in our very niche, niche, niche circle by sort of like the woman who sort of like was the ringleader of like finding other women and, and making this uh, a story, which even that man, it, there, there's so much that like, you know, I mean, hopefully I, I want this just to die and I want to go back to doing a show about talking about being a, a weirdo atheist with depression and, you know, hopefully going back to helping people. Um, but man, if this shit keeps going, I was, I'm like, I'm just going to fucking say everything because this is, there's so much that people don't know, but anyway, let's just take it for, you know, what people do now. So we were getting word of it. I had already moved to Los Angeles and we separated, um, my ex and I, who, who hosted the show with me. And so I said, look, I don't want you to get shit. Um, I know I didn't do anything bad. This isn't going to blow up into a huge story. I was just like, poorly handling being in an open relationship and I was depressed and suicidal in New York and all this stuff. Um, so I was selfish. I was probably very selfish and, you know, slept around and shit like that, but that's as far as it goes. And so I go, I moved to LA. I want to write more. I want to go back to doing stand up. Why don't I step down from the show? Um, I can help you behind the scenes. We can use part of my money to pay a co-host, like part of my split, you know, to, to pay a co-host. And then that's it. And then she was like, great. And then I don't know what happened. When we were still communicating, I did my farewell show. I cried. I said, sorry if I was an asshole to people. Um, I hope I helped. I got a lot of supportive messages. And then I guess the next day, um, these girls kind of doubled down and made it sound like I was a sex predator. And while I was at the gym doing jujitsu, I got to my phone afterwards and my ex-wife wrote a whole thing about how she had heard the accusations and, you know, all this stuff. And so it made it seem like I was fired from the show. The articles that I was fired from the show, the headlines do when you Google me, it literally looks like I was fired for rape, um, or accusations thereof. Um, and yeah, none of that's true. <laughs> uh, I was trying to do the right thing. I was trying to do good by my ex. Um, and, uh, you know, that's fucking what happened. Uh, people get really scared and, uh, uh, online, online storms, man. I mean, you've had them like they're awful. Um, and so, you know, that's what she did and that's what happened. But, uh, yeah, no, I wasn't, I wasn't fired. I, I sort of stepped down to work on other projects and still help with the show. Um, and I just didn't want my ex to get shit for, you know, me fucking around on the road. Okay. So very last question on personal controversy and then we'll, I promise yeah. you we'll, we'll move on to something more positive. No, dude, but, it, it's so hard. I get it. Like I totally fucking get it where it's a weird fucking thing that I went through. And you know, I was saying this the other day where like, and this kind of goes back to the feminism question you were asking in the beginning where it's like, I don't hate women. Um, you know, there was some dumbass article after I went on Rogan's that was like, Jamie Kilstein rebrands as like anti-male feminist. I'm like, I fucking wish I did. Then I wouldn't be fucking poor. I would have a <laughs> book deal. Like I should fucking do that. Um, what I'm going through right now is, I mean, oddly enough, being on like an atheist show, it, it's truly being skeptical. I always assumed that you side with the the person who has the the the, the most whoever's the most uh, disabled whoever's the most uh, has the most you know uh, uh, diversity it's like that's who you side with right because it's true and my stand up will always be going after powerful institutions you know I'm not suddenly gonna be doing stand up about like hey homeless people uh, they fucking they fucking suck I'm gonna go 
piss on their blanket, you know, like but I always wanted to go after institutions, whether it be the government or the church or, 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 or whatever. Um, but in a weird way, progr- uh, that sort of like PC SJW left, we've stopped being critical uh, with our thinking because I think a lot of it's like guilt. A lot of it's like, well, I'm a white straight guy. Yeah. So if someone's telling me that this is what we have to do, it's like, all right, this is what we have to do. Um, you can still think critically and also not be like a bigot. And that's what I'm starting to learn. Right. So with the feminist thing for me, I mean, dude, it was so wild. I literally spent years on Twitter being like, hashtag believe all women. And then you read what's being written about you and you want to be like, ah, hashtag don't believe all women. And then you like, you, you, you talk about how I've talked about guys who are accused of shit, uh, who are accused of being emotionally abusive and, and, and they go online and they, they write, you know, uh, that's just an ex who's crazy and vindictive. And you go, that guy's fucking sexist. He's just covering up like women aren't crazy and vindictive. And then again, I see what happens, what's being written about with my ex. And I want to be like, ah, some bitches are crazy and vindictive. So it's like this, this balance that I'm going through right now, which, which I think is good and healthy. And we're seeing it with me too, where it's like, okay, if we are honest with ourselves and we say we are trying to be good people, we don't want women to feel fucking threatened or pressured into sex or any of this stuff, but also be honest enough that it's like, hey, man, just like there are crazy guys, there are also fucking crazy women and there are women who are going to use this to settle vendettas or grudges, right? Yeah, I mean this. This all. This all sounds. I mean, I'm on board with this. It sounds very sensible. What? But the, I imagine there'll be a, a, a certain amount of cynicism amongst members of my audience who may think that it's a case of well, you've been burned by a bunch of ideologues in your own camp, and and rather than maybe a, a, a fuller change of perspective, maybe you're just moving, shifting sides a little bit in order for some sort of self-preservation. I'm, I'm sure you've had this accusation or question before. Yeah, so I haven't heard it specifically online, um, just because uh, the way I have configured my social media. Um, <laughs> Sanity settings. I, yeah, exactly. But I have thought it a lot in my head. Um, so it's like anybody who is criticizing me, I can save you a lot of time and promise whatever you're saying, I am saying 10 times worse in my own brain. Um, and I think that is the balance I'm trying to find. That's kind of what I was just talking about where it's like, I've seen people do the rebranding thing. Um, and if I was truly doing that, I wouldn't be fucking living on a couch right now. Right? Like if I was truly doing that, I would fucking go for it. And I haven't tweeted against like social justice warriors or fucking anti me too shit. Um, stuff that honestly would probably get me a following. Um, I thought about that when I went on Rogan's show, I'm like, how much, you know, do I want to turn on certain issues? And it's like, when I sat down with Joe for three hours with no script, it's like, nah, man, I still held on to my progressive values. What this is causing me to do because it, it is because it happened to me a hundred percent. It's because it happened to me. Um, Anybody would anybody if they, you know, if you fucking this is a terrible example that would get me in trouble. Um, But if like if you spend your life uh, being like blue lives matter, all cops are good. And then a cop shoots your dog um, or shoot your fucking kid. You're going to like be like, uh, well, maybe I need to rethink things. But have I totally gone the route that that dipshit article said where it's like I'm anti-feminist? It's like, no, this has causing, caused me to ask more questions, to in a weird way be more open-minded, um, to hear the other side out, to start listening to shows like yours or Smalley's or Rubens and still disagree with a lot of stuff but also agree with a lot of stuff. And, you know, it's very bizarre – with as outspoken as I was that I am making my return under a Trump administration and essentially I'm writing a show that's like, Hey, I'm going to write an edgy show about nuance and moderation and talking to the other side, but that's what's happening. So like, yeah, man, I mean, to those people, it's like, if I wanted to sell out fucking, I would be making money, um, which I'm not right now. I'm literally trying to, 
push dialogue and and and, and nuance and moderation and also like evolution's good motherfuckers like you guys are atheists i always hated that shit where it's like if someone changes their mind they're like oh he's a sellout it's like no this is what happens as we get older as we gain life experience and as we get fucked over publicly and feminists and go into hiding for a year you know what i mean <laughs> you gotta like, adapt yeah you fucking you have to adapt Let's, so um, i hope that I, yeah i hope that made sense and yeah. wasn't like sk skirting the question no absolutely I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about comedy in general actually because i i always used to rely on comedians to be the ones that push the boundaries and they they have this superpower really where they can say things the rest of us can't say or that uh, that we're thinking and uh, if you can dress something up uh, that's an important point but make somebody laugh at the same time that's that's an incredibly powerful tool in in discourse i i think but i, I feel like there's an awful lot of self-censoring going on now in the comedic um, community in, the, in that part of the entertainment industry. I mean, you mentioned how how hacky it is to uh, make a Trump joke, and I, I completely agree that those make me... I mean, I'm very anti-Trump, but hearing a comedian get up there and tell Trump jokes makes me roll my eyes. It's very easy. It's very safe. Yeah. You're going to get the quick applause. And I, I was just wondering, what do you think's happening there? Is this going to get to the point where somebody's going to stand stand up and uh, say something really extreme as a way of pushing back? Or, or do you think we're just going to get further uh, further and further down this line of moderation and being scared of saying certain things? Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question. And and, and I've been there, like I said, the, the, the first decade of my career, all of my interviews are like, you got to fucking push the buttons and stand back against these like PC fascist cunts. And then I, the, the other, the latter part of my career was just like, I'm sorry I said that. I'm sorry I offended <laughs> you. Um, and I'm not a sexual predator, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, man, we're, I mean, here's the good news. There's wherever there is a, a backlash, there's rebellion too, right? So the, the, the sort of p there you can still find um, edgy comedy, and they're definitely pushing harder because of this sort of PC backlash, and it's happening mainly in podcasts, right? Um, I think Rogan blew it up, and then you have people like you know Ari Shafir or Burt Kreischer. Um, then you get like really edgy, and you have like a legion of skanks and those New York comics who I've known forever, and uh, Robert Kelly's podcast. I mean, they're really, really they're 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 pushing hard, right? Yeah. Um, Jim Jeffries blew up in the U.S. <laughs> I, I saw mean, uh, Jim Jeffries live last week, and it was the last last gig of this huge tour and he'd, he'd already yeah. got the Netflix Netflix special filmed and in the bag so he just used our date as uh, uh, as basically an opportunity to drink a lot and fall about a bit so yep. I'll, I'll have to wait for the special to land to find out what the actual act is but oh, yeah so he's, al he's always fun well he's a really interesting case right where he's someone who got a lot of shit his whole career by sort of the PC people. And then the 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 clip that made him a rock star in the US the gun control, was his whole it? Yes, was the gun control. So his last Netflix special opens with a 20-minute rape joke <laughs> where he's talking about Cosby, he's talking about uh the the complaints he's gotten for rape jokes, and it's brilliant, it's great. Um and the left is just kind of like Beep, -doop, -ba doop and like doesn't really go after him, which is which is great. He was funny enough where he almost like he beat that rush, right? Um, David Letterman was accused of what a lot of people are losing their jobs of uh, for right now. He was accused of cheating on his wife and fucking someone who worked for the show. Right. And David Letterman, like we forgot about that. And David Letterman now has a huge Netflix talk show where he interviewed Barack Obama. Yeah, I watched that. Yeah, and uh, was given the Mark Twain Award at this huge ceremony that was aired on TV, right, with like every comedian honoring him. Again, good, right? Ah, oh, so it's a case if you're in the if you're in the club, if you're in the leftist club, you maybe get an, a, a sort of a, a modicum of protection that other people don't get. You get you get a pass. So like. Here's a really good example that I've tried desperately not to talk about, um, but fuck it. Um, I really, Smalley was like, just told me how wonderful your and supportive your audience was, and actually told me that 
uh, I hope it's okay to say that your audience got him through a lot. Um, uh, uh, just emotionally. Um, and that's why I got so fucking excited to, to do the show. Cause it's been a while since I felt like people actually have my back, you know, like even the, even there are, there are some of my old fans who, you know, I, I just started a Patreon for fuck up pod and a bunch of my old fans reached out and signed up and like, that made me so happy. But I almost feel like anytime I get an Instagram follower or a uh, fucking Patreon, it's like a, a fluke where I'm like, oh, they must not have known, or how did this happen? And I mean, dude, it's insane. Like, I walk into a comedy club, and I've been fired, by the way. Like, when the Louis thing happened, I had a manager want to work with me, and he read the article, and he said, this is garbage. You aren't accused of anything. Um, you know, comics talk about worse stuff on stage. And then the Louis thing happened, and his company went on lockdown, and he was like, I can't risk it. Just because when you Google me, that's what comes up. Do you think Louis um, will reemerge? Do you think we'll see him, see or hear from him again? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think it's going to be brilliant. I think he's going to do a show about this. Uh, it has I think to it's really, be, doesn't it? It's the only way, I think. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think it'll be like a year or two. Um, but yeah, no, I really do. Um, but it was crazy to like lose work for me over over that stuff. And people write comedy clubs. If my name comes up at a comedy club, people will write them and be like, he's accused of sexual, being a sexual predator. And it's like, I'm not. But because of the climate we're in, clubs will push out and get too scared and, and, and they'll bail. So one of the things that really fucked, you know, and I hate to sound like a fucking victim on this, but one of the things that like dicked me over and it goes to your question is there was a, when you talked about power, right? When it, there was a comedian who I haven't named on any shows, but a very famous comedian that I was a fan of. Um, let's just say I don't have a patent on, <laughs> out, on outing people. Ding. Um, and let's also say his last name is Oswald. <laughs> um, I, I've done too many fucking shows where I've hit, like not mentioned his name. And I'm like, it was just so fucking insane where after I did Rogan's, he just goes on this tweet storm just attacking me for being like anti-feminist and no way listen to the show because I wasn't um, going after me, making me like – and he did this when oh, the story broke too. This fucking like suicidal homeless nobody just like sending his millions of fans after me. Most people probably didn't even know who the fuck I was um, and it was awful. Uh, I've never said a bad word about him. He used to follow me on Twitter, but here's my theory. Uh, he's been called a sexist a lot, but really wants to still be like king of the left. Um, my other theory, uh, which is, I mean, I would say more than a theory, is that was the day that everybody was bash uh, was uh, distancing themselves from Louis. That was the day that all the comics, even famous comics, even comics who were friends with Louis, had to publicly tweet, uh, I do not think you should hmm, masturbate in front of cool. women. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, not cool. And uh, who's an easier target, right? Louis, who is going to come back and has power. That manager, Dave Becky, who, you know, all those guys know. Um, or this fucking loser who's already been beaten down, which is me. Well, if you want your feminist cred, it's fucking easy to go after me. Um, and you can use that to avoid being like the only fucking person who didn't mention Louis at that time. Um, so I do think power means a lot, right? Like who's going to bring up the Letterman thing now that he has a show you can go back on again. I don't think it's good. Uh, I don't think you should do that, but it's easier to go after. I mean, oddly enough to punch down, right? <laughs> uh, and, and that's what happens. So, you know, anyway, uh, to get off that. So to go back to comedy, yeah, man, I think comedy will reemerge as a really important place to ask these questions. I'm seeing it at the comedy store in Los Angeles. I'm sure it's happening in New York. Um, but I self-censored so much. There were so many times on my podcast after being a comic that talked about, you know, pushing boundaries and shit like that. Um, that we would, I would make a joke that I thought was really funny and it would be deemed offensive and we would press pause and we would delete it. And then I just started to self-censor and I still do, um, on Twitter, you know, I wanted, uh, <laughs> uh, Moby, my last girlfriend, uh, I stayed with a little too long because she, 
she she really had my back and, and, and was amazing during when all this stuff happened and, and made me feel not like a predator. I mean, to have like this gorgeous, amazing girlfriend was awesome. But she also had a bit of a a bit of a manic streak. And uh, she would like throw shit at me. She would get like physically uh, like actually physically abusive. And Moby said to me one day, uh, he goes, if only people knew that while you were accused of being uh, emotionally abusive, you were literally in a physically abusive relationship. And I wanted my first tweet back to be that and hashtag it me too. And I was like, I can't do that. Um, and then I wanted my second tweet back <laughs> to be that YouTuber who got in trouble for the dead body stuff, that Logan guy. Oh yeah. Uh, that happened the week I restarted my YouTube and I wanted to write, uh, well, now I got to delete all these dead body videos <laughs> I was going to post. <laughs> uh, and I also didn't write that. Um, and I think a lot of people, man, a lot, if, if you call Donald Trump a cunt on Twitter, progressives wouldn't know what to do. They would be like, ah, short circuiting, wires crossing, don't like Donald Trump, but cunt is offensive to women or whatever. Um, but I think that, I think shit's getting so stupid and so ridiculous that, I mean, you're doing an injustice to people who are actually abused or, you know, if, if everything you say is racist, it's taking away from actual racist things that happen, right? If sure. everything, if you get into a, a verbal fight with your girlfriend and you call that emotional abuse, what happens to the guy who is pretty much like locked down his girlfriend and made sure she doesn't have any fucking friends and she's not allowed to go out and has to report to him and like, you know what I mean? Well, like, here's a good question because we seem to be getting in this area now and um, I mean, Matt Damon got in trouble. When, when people are trying to have this um, conversation about what constitutes abuse and sexual harassment and what's the difference between obviously rape and touching somebody inappropriately and things like that. There seems to be an awful lot of conflation going on. And in fact, it would be helpful to the victims of these transgressions if we did define it properly and have a, an open conversation. However, when anyone tries to separate these things out, instantly the finger comes pointing at you that you're an apologist for rape or apologist for sexual abuse, etc. And it's it's how do we um how do we continue having proper, detailed, nuanced discussions and being able to fight back the mob at the same time because they could be you know better than anyone they can be a completely overwhelming force and have a real you know direct effect on your on your life dude when matt damon was trending on twitter in my old circle because i still follow a bunch of those people it was like he was fucking accused of sexual assault yeah when all he did was he I mean, dude, he prefaced it by being like, what's happening right now is so important and we need to get rid of these predators and like, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, he's like, but hey, just throwing this out here is grabbing someone on the ass uh, as bad as rape, which, by the way. It is, dude, I had a fucking woman who spoke at the Woman's March call me when I was Googling ways to kill myself and all this shit happened. And she was like, this makes it harder for us to do our jobs to get rid of actual abusers, right? Well, the reaction or the, the comments of Matt Damon. Well, the, 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 the reaction right. and also like calling ass padding putting it on the same level as rape, hmm. putting even Louis with Harvey Weinstein, let alone Aziz yeah. or, or whoever, where it's like, hey, here's how I know that ass padding is uh, different than rape. I've never seen a baseball player uh, rape his teammate on the field after a good play. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've never seen him be like, good run, no, get on the ground. Like that's <laughs> never fucking happened. And if we start equating the two, then what will happen is women who are actually assaulted and who are actually fucking raped are going to come forward, which they're fucking afraid to come forward already. So many rapes and assaults don't get reported. Right. Um, and a bunch of people are going to be like, oh, yeah, sure. Is this just like, what did he grab your ass? Did he, you know, I mean, the Al Franken thing was insane. The Al Franken thing, this woman wrote a whole fucking dumbass piece about how I wanted a picture with him and he squeezed my side. And mm. then she goes, she goes, I don't even let my husband do that. And it's like, okay, homie, th that's a you problem. That's not a fucking you're posing for a picture thing. That's like you don't like to be touched. You don't let your husband put your arm around her, he, he, your, your waist. Like Al Franken should not have to fucking resign for this shit. Um, so I, I do think, yeah, I think it's really, I think it's really dangerous. And I think that. Uh, I mean, Matt Damon, you can say that we have free speech and I, I, I believe it, but 
I mean, dude, is he going to want to speak up again about this shit? Like, I don't want to, I, I don't want to fucking tweet about me too or about anything like that. I mean, not like my voice missing to the conversation is like a national tragedy, but like, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the problem is, if I, I know what you mean, though. You, you kind of you kind of think you, you you put your ten cents together, and you think I'm going to put this out there, and then you think, you know what? It's just probably not worth it. I think I, I think I, I remember reading something from Sam Harris once, and he said, "Not not everything worth saying is worth saying oneself." So that's that's how I justify yeah. ignoring some things nowadays. Yeah, man, and it's also like what you said before is also really scary. Where it's not like if you go, you know, hey, Me Too is important. Um, but I think we should really make a difference between, you know, grabbing someone on the ass or asking someone out on a date at work and r- rapists. Right. Um, the problem is not only will you get attacked online, but yeah, like you said, you'll be a rape apologist. Yeah. And now that shit, that shit sticks to you. You're called a racist. You're called, you know, I was emailing with Sam Harris about this where I'm like, yeah, man, I probably called him a racist. And I was like, sorry, homie. Um, and we just throw those words out. So, so loosely now, and it can ruin someone's fucking life. It can ruin someone's career. And, you know, I didn't, the reason I didn't come out publicly, by the way, thank you so much for trying to change the subject to stand up comedy. And uh, <laughs> apparently I still have a bunch of demons I have to work out because I'm like, no, 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 no. Fuck comedy. Back to me being accused of sexual assault and trying to kill myself. <laughs> yeah, um, that's where the comedy lies. But I one of the reasons and uh, the, listen to how fucked up this is. One of the reasons I didn't say anything publicly and defend myself, even though all of my friends did high, really well-known liberal feminist people were like, this is bullshit. You have to make a statement. Um, you know, the most obvious reason was self-preservation, which is I was just literally trying not to commit suicide. And I knew if I wrote something that would cause a rebuttal and it would just keep going. Uh, And I just wanted it to, yeah, I just wanted it to die. Um, but there was another feminist reason where I was like, I was so used to the guy is never right. And even if someone is falsely accused of rape, that doesn't matter because statistically there's more women who are raped. So I would just be like, shut the fuck up. Um, if a guy's like, wah, wah, I was falsely accused. It's like, well, sorry, dude, we don't prosecute uh, enough rapists. And it's kind you know, of collateral damage in a sense. It's, oh, dude, yeah, what a brilliant way to put it. Yeah, it's collateral damage. And I was afraid that if I made a statement, all of these sexists or whatever would use my case against women. And I know that sounds like it's like I'm still trying to be the self-righteous hero, but it's like I was sort of trained that way. And that's really what I thought. And so I would rather never do comedy again and disappear then that's why when people are like, are you selling out? Are you just switching? It's like, I know in my heart you're not because I went away for a really long time. Um, and I never thought I would do what I love again. And, um, you know, that was one of the reasons. Um, so it, and now, you know, I could be a voice for someone who's like, hey, guys, I don't hate women, but also like we got to be more critical about this because dudes lives can be ruined. Like the Aziz thing is out of hand. Um, and if the bar keeps lowering from, you know, Weinstein to Louis to Aziz to, you know, I, I, again, guys asking women out, it's like that's that's dangerous for men and women. Um, that's not just me trying to protect my own ass. You've mentioned a few times now about you've, you've referenced like being suicidal and how that's not right pickings for comedy. And on the outset of it, obviously, I'm, I'm sure, you know, that, that 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 does make sense to me. But I mean, is there something to be said about the role adversity and being kind of deeply unhappy with the way the world is and, and your lot in general that actually lends itself to taking a comedic view of the world. I mean, I think comedians can sometimes, if they become too comfortable, too successful, they tend to lose their edge. Um, what I'm saying is, Jamie, do you have to stay miserable to make me laugh? Ha, dude, I have been thinking about this a lot recently. Right. Um. So, you know, I mean, 
you look at like the the artwork for the new podcast and it's me fucking face down uh, and it's called Fuck Up Pod. And this year after I, you know, when I, I at least temporarily held back the, the suicide stuff, I threw myself into – uh, eating right and uh, reading more and doing yoga and, and jujitsu and Muay Thai every day and uh, teaching, which is something I've never done and calling my family more and just trying to be and hiking and all this shit and trying to be a, a more well-rounded person. And the first time I played the comedy store, it was for this Bill Hicks tribute. And Bill Hicks's brother got me on the show. Like his brother and mom were there, which is crazy because, you know, the comedy store won't book me. Uh, but it was cool to be like fucking backdoored in by like Bill Hicks's family, you know. And uh, and I'm getting ready for this show and I'm like super nervous. And my first time back actually was with Stanhope. My first time doing stand up. It was at uh, Bill Burr's uh, like podcast festival. And I literally asked myself that. I like wasn't really drinking a lot this year and I was like, I've started drinking again uh, and I was like, oh, OK, I guess I got to be like depressed and bitter and I got to be angry. I got to tweet. I got to tweet, uh, you know, angry things about Trump and, and shit like that. And I've had to walk it back. I've had to be like, hey, I can still be observant and self-aware. In fact, I can probably be more self-aware and more confident if I kind of keep this this healthy outlook. I mean, I'm always going to have depression and I'm always going to have thoughts like that, but if I can balance it now is kind of what I'm trying to do. But dude, that was my first thought. I mean, but look at how it ends, right? Like that's sure. what's so sad. Like, like Robin was one of my best friends and like, I mean, dude, Robin Williams called me to help talk me out of suicide. Like how fucked wow. up is that going to make you when like your lifeline, like the two of the only people who have like talk to me about suicide were my English teacher in high school and Robin and they both killed themselves. That will fuck you up um, where you're just like, oh, my God, Jesus Christ. Even the people who don't think I should do it, they did it. Um, and I think that it kind of comes back to what I was talking about, where comedy is such a great defense mechanism. And I forgot about this. I forgot about this when I was on the side of the left that would go after comics. I forgot that. The majority of comics are not mean spirited. They're broken and they're addicts and they're sad and they're hysterical and they deal with their demons by talking about it on stage. And hopefully that makes other people with those demons feel like they're not alone. And that's always what I tried to do. Um, and that's what I want to do now. And that's, that's what I wanted to do. But you know, I, I, I think that my side just, we just, again, just like me, you see the headlines about me, it looks horrible. And we just read the headlines, Daniel Tosh make rape joke, or, you know, is rape funny? Jim Jeffrey says yes. And shit like that. And it's like, no, man, like it's more than that. If you go see the show, like Jim Jeffries talks about how he was molested. And like, I mean, there's, there's so much more nuance that we just don't get from these sort of online um, headlines. But I do think that, yeah, I think that comedy comes from pain. If you saw a famous comic and all their material was like, hey, so uh, my parents love me and uh, I've been married uh, and have two beautiful children and a, a dog that won't quit, you know? Oh, I fuck mean, that he guy. Just, he <laughs> did, oh, you're so mad, right? Like so fucking mad. Um, whereas you want to see, I mean, God, man, I wonder if Richard Pryor could have the special that, uh, that where he talked about being abusive and being addicted to crack. And like, I mean, that special was so iconic and it's like, I don't think that could happen now. I don't know. Um, but comedy is so cathartic and it, it can be such a healthy tool for the performer and the audience. Um, I do hope we don't lose that. Um, and and I, I deeply regret being on sort of that side that turned on it. Um, but I, I, I do think that uh, there is a backlash. And also, I think like the more people can be honest on stage and honest on Twitter without being attacked, it's like the healthier for them, man. I mean, if we can be open to dialogue and, and, and taking jokes and, and stuff again, I, I, I think that's what we need nowadays more than ever. Sure. I mean, I, I did want to, you know, you just reminded me 
um, just to take a massive left turn when you when you said you've been yeah. e- you've been eating healthier and things like that. It reminded me that when when people have described you before, they've said you know he's an ex male feminist and ex, you know ex vegan, and they they tend to uh, make the make the equivalence between those two things as if they're both kind of faulty ideologies. Now I think that's a little unfair primarily because i'm a vegan so this is this is personal oh, is no what way. i'm saying i didn't know that yeah but i mean i'm, I'm very aware of the uh the preachy evangelical holy than now annoying vegan i, I often joke that they're, they're the kind of people that make me want to consider cannibalism um yeah, 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 yeah. but i mean so what happened there then i'm assuming that, that i mean they talk about it like you're you're no longer a vegan and i was, adam this is the kind of conversation this is the part of the conversation generally when i lose my audience they seem to be on board with me in terms of of politics and, and religion, secularism, and, and, and approaches to um, you know overt radical feminism and things like that. The second you start talking about meat consumption, I tend to lose more or less everybody. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on on the issue of uh, no longer eating animals. Whether you you now do eat meat, and, and what was the change you went through? Oh, that's so interesting. Okay, so yeah, I have a million thoughts on this. Um, so in, in terms of losing your audience, it's so. It's so funny. I mean, I feel like it comes down to like put up or shut up. I think that's why people, I I think people get really defensive about eating animals for two reasons. One, the majority of people aren't sociopaths and they love animals, whether it's their dog or fucking they share the video of baby pig playing with the cat uh, or the cows jumping through the grass or the, the, the dangerous lion that was reunited uh, with, with, with the, the, the man who, who raised him from infant, infancy and instead of attacking him, he hugs him and they, they play a sad song on YouTube and I watch that while crying at 2 in the morning. Like, um, we love animals, right? And we don't want to think about it. Like, when I grew up, it's like you don't I think most kids would be vegans, right? Like the little mermaid is straight up vegan propaganda. Like we grew up with all of our like cartoon heroes being animals. Uh, we go to petting zoos. Uh, we have our cats, we have our dogs. Uh, when you are fed McNuggets, you don't think of it as chicken. You just think of it as this, like, I don't know what the fucking McNugget is, but like, uh, it is this thing called a McNugget. And, so you eat it. So when people talk about veganism or whatever, I think the re- I, I, I think why people get so defensive is essentially they're just like, shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up, shut the fuck mm. up. I don't want to think I don't want to think about it. And I think it's because they are kind of like, you know, a good person and they don't want to think about it um, because they do like animals and it's horrible how we treat animals uh, in our society. Right. I also think it's sort of politically it's a put up or shut up moment where dude, I used to get infinitely more shit from the left than I did from the right about being vegan. And the reason is I convinced that conservatives were like, yeah, of course he's vegan because he's also gay. And that's the same thing, right? You know what I mean? (laughs) He he eats the gay shit. He eats kale. He eats that fucking soy boy. Yeah. That's a new one I've seen. Exactly. That's the new one. Um, but on the left, I think the reason they would become so fucking vitriolic and so angry is because they're tweeting all day about their fucking cat because they're a sad blogger. They're posting about um, climate change, which Factory Farm is like the number one contributor to it. Right. Uh, yeah. They're writing about uh, labor um, and think about how those employees are are, are are treated. They're talking about immigration. They're talking about all of these issues, hunger, all of these issues that are directly tied into our consumption of animals. So when they see someone talk about veganism, it's just fucking projection because it's a change we can actually make. I can talk about supporting gay people and I don't have to start sucking dick, hmm. right? I, I can talk about the war and I don't have to like – strap on a parachute and go over to Iraq. I can talk shit from a distance on all of that with animals. It's like you can actually do something right now. You can actually stop eating animals. And I empathize because food is so important to people. It's how we celebrate. It's how we, um, it's how we, when we feel bad, it's how we like nurture ourselves. It's, we go out to, to to friends, uh, with friends. We, we have nostalgic meals that our mom used to make us like a meatloaf or whatever. Like I get it. Um, but I think that's why people get so defensive. I, even if I'm never a vegan again, I would never attack vegans or be anti vegan because I'm like, Hey man, I fucking caved and I still love animals and believe it. So you guys please keep going and doing it. Um, 
you know, so uh, I haven't wanted to, I haven't, I've publicly dodged this question. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Got, oh, no, no, no. I hope, I hope fucking, I, I just hope Smalley's right and your audience is supportive or I've like fucked myself a million times for this show. Um, <laughs> you, you'll come off better than me here because you, you're, you're back on, back on animals. So that they'll be happy with that. It's, uh, it's me they tend to get annoyed with. Ha, that's funny. No, uh, I started, um, I started eating, uh, I started eating eggs and fish because um, remember, I also have to do and teach MMA twice a week and I was just feeling – or twice a day and I was just feeling fucking beat down, um, which is so annoying because for 10 years I would just shout. I was like, you can get enough vegan as a pro- – or you can get enough protein as vegan and if somebody tells you you don't get enough protein or where you get your protein, just say, I get it from your dad's cock and shove him <laughs> over and r- run away uh, and I would be – but honestly like – I was getting so shaky and especially like I used to have the money and the time because I didn't have a day job uh, to cook so I could cook all day and I could train and I can get enough protein and I had money to buy healthy shit and you can still be a vegan uh, on the cheap, right? It's like you're buying produce and beans and chickpeas and like that's not expensive stuff. It's actually the stuff that's the most expensive is garbage for you. It's all that processed shit anyway, Mm. uh, which you don't want. But I was so – poor and busy that I'm like, I can make eggs in the morning and feel better and be able to train all day and not get hungry. Um, with that said, I fucking get back onto social media. Um, oh, and I, I had a burger. Uh, I got back onto social media and I forgot I fucking follow all these goddamn vegan accounts. Oh no, just guilt trip. And my, dude, my whole feed is like baby pig snuggly. Goddamn <laughs> Moby posted a picture the other day of a baby chick walking up to a dead baby chick and like <laughs> trying to hold it. And it was just like, he just lost his best friend. And oh, I was just like, Moby. Oh my fucking God, I can never fucking eat chicken. Um, so I'm trying to like, I'm trying to figure it out because I love animals more than fucking humans. Um, I also am trying to eat less carbs and cut sugar out. Mm. Um, I operate way better. I'm definitely, I know it's trendy now, like keto and paleo and all that shit, but I get super carb addicted. Like, I cannot eat one piece of pizza. I will eat the entire pizza and then I will fall asleep for four hours. So I'm trying to cut that shit out and find substitutions that are vegan. Um, Potato chips are the the uh, the issue for me. Like especially when I travel to the states, because you guys don't do normal sized anything really you kind of the oh, the share bag yeah. seems seems more or less standard when it comes to potato chips and we, yeah, I, can, I can only have, I, I, I walk around with a, like an orange face most of the time i'm in in the states because that's yeah. the the only place i can get the authentic cheetos because uh, oh there's, right. there's something there's yeah. something in the american ones that i don't think due to eu laws it's allowed to be sold in the in the british version because it's just not there <laughs> some weird chemical or whatever it's probably slowly I, killing I me i love the the eu fucking cheeto laws where they're just like oh this is a fucking drug we cannot <laughs> yeah. have this and yeah. then americans are just like chomp 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 it's a tiger or yeah. whatever uh yeah dude so i i really do want to find a way but again this has to do with just being skeptical and asking questions where it's like, okay, I want to continue and go back to being a vegan, um, you know, entirely, um, because I love animals and, you know, I, I will not eat anything from factory farms, which means I don't eat meat, uh, when I go out. Cause 99% of that is factory farms. I don't have it in the house. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, like I, I know where the fish comes from, where the eggs come from, et cetera, et cetera. I used to hate people who said that shit. Um, my goal is to work back up to vegan veganism. Will I say that having a bunch of fucking vegans saying like horrible fucking things to me, uh, made it a little easier? Of course. And that's where your fans are right. I would be a fucking liar if I didn't suddenly have all my vegan fans turn on me and I was like, well, I've missed cheeseburger, so fuck you guys. <laughs> but it's like, I'm not affecting them. I'm affecting animals that are tortured, right? Yeah. Um, but with the health thing, I was like, it's so fascinating. And I wonder what you think of this actually, where I started reading a bunch of stuff on like keto and paleo only because, you know, there are people who have like a paleo vegan approach almost. Um, and just as an athlete, I have to do it. Um, but it's so fascinating. Cause like, so all of our documentaries, right. All the vegan documentaries are like, 
uh, animal products are the number one cause of cancer. And to beat that, you have to go vegan. And then I started reading this paleo stuff and they're like, the number one way to beat cancer is to go paleo. And it's like, wait a second, you motherfuckers are using the exact same talking points. How is it both? How is it both right? Hmm. And, and, and that was a moment for me where I'm like, God, we do need to start either communicating better or not going off into our little bubbles. Cause the fact that the paleo people use the exact same talking points as the vegan people fucking blew my mind. And that's when I was like, these internet tribes that we have created are fucking dangerous. Like, uh, I, I've been emailing, I'm going to have him on the show. This guy, Rob Wolf, who's like the biggest paleo guy. Uh, and I met him because whenever he went on Rogan's show, a bunch of people would at both of us. And they're like, Hey Rob, you got to kick this faggot's ass. And like, so I emailed him and I'm like, yo, we should probably be friends. Right. And so now we're like buddies. Um, but we have a lot in common. Whereas we both want to get rid of factory farms. We both think that the majority of your meals should be vegetables. Um, a lot of pa people think paleo is like, yeah, I just fucking can eat McDonald's and throw the bread away. And it's like, well, no, that's not the case either. So being able to have vegans and paleo people communicate or people who care about health or sustainability is – really, really important. And to get to the bottom of this bullshit where it's like, how can these two diametrically opposed eating styles be using the same talking points? Is one of them full of shit? Is the culprit maybe sugar and maybe vegan people shouldn't be uh, advocating all of this like super processed sugar heavy shit just to get more people to go vegan at the risk of their health? I don't fucking know. Um, I unfortunately do know that I would get so hungry to the point where I thought I had like a blood sugar issue and when I put eggs into my dad, like I haven't eaten yet this morning and it's 11, like I had coffee with some coconut oil and before I would have had to have two meals. I would have, or yeah. else I would have fucking passed out. Um, so I think that the conversation shouldn't end with you are a bad person if you say for health reasons you're not vegan. The conversation should be, well, let's figure out a way that we can do it yeah. without hurting animals, but you can still stay healthy instead of feeling self-righteous when all you're doing is eating Cheetos all day. I did that when I was vegetarian. I would put like fucking pizza on top of pizza and be like, I'm eating a pizza sandwich. I'm healthier than these fucking athletes yeah, who are eating yeah. their, gra their grass-fed steak because um, you would feel self-righteous about That's it. That's the thing. Pe um, people, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things, a lot of stuff, misinformation with vegetarian and vegan diets. People will sell it as a catch-all solution to your health and weight problems. And that that's completely not true basically you can be a healthy vegan or you can be an unhealthy vegan you can be a healthy meat eater or an unhealthy meat eater it depends on exactly. how much of what you eat and uh, you know how often and with what so i think people just need to be a bit more savvy about um what sort of information they're getting but um jamie we've uh, we've gone over an hour it's completely flown by uh, a, oh, dude, a lot this covered was so this was so fun. And by the way, if part of your audience are calling me sellouts now, I might as well sell out. If you got, if one of your listeners sends me a thousand dollars on my Patreon, I will live stream. I will fucking eat a steak while, <laughs> be, while beating off to someone who doesn't want to be there. Whatever, whatever you guys want. If you're going to call me sellout, then I will put, let me at least reap the rewards. Um, <laughs> Would you go to patreon.com slash fuck up pod? Um, yeah, no, man, this was a fucking blast. This was so nice talking and like we have to hang out. We'll get vegan food in uh where are you based? Are you in are you in London? Uh, Manchester, just so north of London. Oh great. I'm well I'm sure because I'm gonna go do uh previews for my Edinburgh show all around the UK. Um so I'm sure I'll hit Manchester and I remember them having good vegan spots or like hippie places. Definitely uh, so give me go, a show. Uh, yeah, we can go get food and get hammered and go prey on some women. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm great. Just, just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, no, thank you, man. Um, can I plug my shit just because I got to take advantage of this? Next I thing I was going to ask. Yeah, go for it. Shoot. Oh, I should have waited and not seemed so desperate. Uh, okay. So my Twitter, which is probably where I'm the most active, is at Jamie Kilstein. Um, my Facebook is facebook.com slash Jamie Kilstein fan page. If you guys could do me a super solid, I had to restart my Instagram after deleting it and going into hiding. And it's just the saddest looking because they're the least followers. But it's also my favorite because everyone seems nicer on Instagram. Um, it's fuck up pod. So F-U-C-K-P-O-D. Uh, so Instagram.com slash fuck up pod. And then the podcast, which is is um, 
I'm really proud of it. Like this Moby episode next week is fucking great. Um, I interviewed Sam Tripoli and I'm going to have Joey Diaz on who you guys probably know from Rogan and uh, talking to Sam Harris. And like, I really want to blow it up and have it be dialogue like this where we're not just yelling at each other and someone can go, Hey, I was wrong. And I just tell fucked up stories. And I've started doing a segment where I just talk about my, my Tinder disasters. Um, <laughs> so it's not preachy. It's actually fun. It's what I started off doing. Um, that you can get on iTunes F up pod with Jamie Kilstein. Um, and then the Patreon, which will blow it up so I can do more episodes. Um, and so I can survive is patreon.com slash fuck up pod. Awesome, Jamie. Thank you very much for coming on and speaking to me. I, I'll, uh, I'll have to let you get back for something to eat now since uh, it's 11 o'clock. I'm and so you're not, hungry. That's I'm crazy so talk. I'd be, so I'd be in such a foul mood if I were you. Dude, uh, yeah. And uh, and just so your listeners go to my Patreon and show me some love, I'm going to go fucking uh, kick a veal and eat it. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Thank you so much, man. Thank you for listening to the Godless Spellchecker podcast. The podcast is a one-man operation, producing my spare time away from my day job, and I love making it for you. If you enjoy what you hear, please consider lending some support. The show is entirely listener-supported, I don't sell anything, I don't run ads, and uh, given the alternative and unpopular focus of my content, it's very unlikely to find a sponsor. So, there are a number of ways you can support and chip in and, and help improve the show and give me more time to produce more content. You can become a patron supporter and pledge a monetary amount per month or per episode by visiting patreon.com forward slash gspellchecker. If you can't lend monetary support right now, don't worry, there's other ways you can help the podcast too. You can share it on your various social media networks, or take a moment to leave a review wherever you listen to it. Your support is massively appreciated, thank you. Think we've all learned something here today?